Okay, uh, this is the uh, Coverity, you know, says fuzz issue solving thing. So what I've done here is I've left out all of the simple stuff. So if there's any simple bugs reported, that's uh, not really at, uh, at heart here. It's just the more interesting things, uh, techniques to get rid of uh, more complicated coverity warnings and uh, ways to solve some of the OSS fuzz uh, issues that arise as well. There will be lots of um, 3D slide transitions to keep you entertained and also to make sure that they work. I um, did it all in my development version where the slide transitions work perfectly fine and then they didn't actually work in the um, Fedora version, which can be tracked down to a change in how GLM works. And there is a Fedora updates testing there since yesterday that has slide transitions working for Fedora again. So I guess as a, as a tradition, traditional, uh, going to the conferences makes you use your own software to realize what bugs need to be fixed. All right, so the configuration we have for uh, Coverity. Uh, the way Coverity works is that you build it locally on your side, and then that outputs a great big blob, which is uploaded to their server, and their server does the analysis on that. So uh, uh, in the at least in the open source version that we use, you don't um, check the results locally. You have to use their website and their output to see what um, uh, the, the results are. The way we've configured nowadays is that it's fully public and the pass it defaults to private. You get a check, chance to look at the bugs first yourself and decide whether to make them public or not. Uh, once we fixed all of the bugs, we just set it to be uh, public because we had no legacy issues that we needed to be concerned about anymore. So if you had ever uh, apply to be a member of any of these projects. You don't need to be a member of the LibreOffice one. All the issues are public. Um, in the older versions of Coverity, your project was either C++ one or a Java one. Now it picks up both Java and C++ in uh, LibreOffice and reports issues on both languages. Uh, Coverity does not support uh, C++ 2A, but does relatively recently support C++ 17, which means that we patch our configure to uh, go down back down to C++17 to get it past uh, the Coverity tooling. And we only scan LibreOffice itself. We don't worry about any of the third-party projects that we use. Some of those are scanned separately and some of them are other people's issues. Uh, this is how the website uh, that you see the results looks in. Um, the results are emailed to the list, but the UI on the website is superior when you do have a non-trivial issue. This is an example case of something where there's a uninitialized uh, members and it's just reported like that. Uh, a lot of the warnings that Coverity gives are kind of heuristic based as opposed to like um, a guaranteed, uh, well, heuristic based in the sense that um, if there are no uh, members uh, initialized in your struct, it won't warn about that. It assumes you know what you're doing. If you initialize most of them, but then not one or two, it'll warn about that. The same is true for a lot of the cases that it'll look at kind of statistically whether or not things are uh, out of abnormal. So your code can be unchanged, somebody can delete a couple of lines of code, and that means the statistics for this particular pattern changes. So you get new warnings even though new, no change has been made to the code that's been warned about. The overall state has changed. So warnings can appear and disappear not, with nothing to do with the actual lines of code being reported. So uh, you'll say like if there's 55 times somebody checks the uh, return value and then the case is introduced and it doesn't, then that's something that's worth flagging. But if it's 30-30 and then somebody changes one of them, then the change is from 29-30 and then you might get 29 warnings saying that the return value isn't checked. Uh, so that's why things sometimes appear and disappear. Uh, if you want to waive a warning, um, you can just do it directly in the web interface. You can say this is not a warning, this is a false positive, this is intentional. But if you do that, you have two issues. The first issue is that if the code changes sufficiently that Coverity can no longer track that it's the same code, a warning will reappear. And then that only affects that Coverity instance. Inside in Red Hat, we run another instance of Coverity and we put LibreOffice through the paces on that one as well. So if I f get rid of false positives in one, I don't get rid of them in the other unless I do something that can be detected by both instances. So we have the um, annotation stuff here. And there's two possibilities with annotation, um, which I know work and I've seen documented uh, in our own internal documentation in Red Hat but it seems to be hard to find out on the public web, which is that if you use the um, warning name that I'd highlighted in the earlier slide, the uninitialized member, put it between the brackets, coverty, whatever, and put an optional comment, it becomes marked as an intentional issue inside in the web interface. But then if you use the space full colon false, it's marked as a false positive automatically. 
which is convenient. So here then, uh, the top one is inside in calc where there's a struct that's deliberately not initialized. It has some uh, an OU string member, which is a default constructor. So some of its members are initialized and others not. You can say that they're all deliberately uh, not initialized with that one. Uh, it's an intentional issue. And then the other one is where there's a copy and paste error, which is just completely spurious. And that can be marked as a false positive. Uh, then the other annotation is that you can set a, 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 a function to be told that it's like a, a fatal function, that if this function is called, that's your program will terminate at that point. Um, that's automatically in place for things like assert and abort, obviously. And then you can add annotations, in our case, to the CPP unit um, call that reports a, an error. How it actually reports an error is it throws an exception that's unhandled. So if you leave things in their default state, you get 5,000 warnings saying that you've unhandled exceptions in LibreOffice. But they're all from the deliberately, uh, it's meant to deliberately fail in our CPP unit tests. So that's annotated as being a fatal function. Once that's called, um, a Converge knows that it's uh, the end of execution and that any of follow-up issues are, can be just dismissed automatically. We run the Converge runs with the enable assert always abort. So any asserts that you put in will also, if triggered, uh, terminate flow. So if you were to run without that flag, you would find that there are warnings inside the office that it would not be handled. But because we say assert is fatal, which means that we really mean what we say when we have an assert. We say an assert will not happen. Uh, so they're not for use for like uh, trivial issues. You use your warns instead because you are removing them from the source code analysis if you use an assert that's not a true assert. What's really difficult um, sometimes is the tainted data. You want to know if something is tainted data if you're reading data from a a file format, a Microsoft Office binary file format, if the values are untrusted, if it says that there's, you know, uh, minus one uh, uh, values to follow and then you try to allocate minus one values, then you have an issue there. So you want to know that this data is untrusted. But there are cases where Coverity uh, will say this data is untrusted, but you happen to know that that data is data that's shipped with LibreOffice and it actually is trusted data. Uh, so in this case, in this example, we don't want to say that all values that come back from that uh, uh, function are trusted, but just in this specific case, we trust uh, that data. And this markup here, uh, calling Coverity tainted data to sanitize, will say that this data is trusted, and that removes that issue. Uh, this all comes back from the, uh, the heart bleed uh, issue in OpenSSL, and at that point, uh, Coverity added this support by detecting common byte swapping uh, techniques as being a way to know that certain data is um, tainted. So the other solution, um, whether it still works or not, I haven't <coughs> double-checked, is that if you use the then-documented non-standard swapping pattern, then uh, Coverity will not consider that data as tainted. So if you wanted to say that all data that comes back from this uh, function can be trusted, uh, despite the byte swapping, you can byte swap in that style and uh, apparently it will consider it uh, untainted. And if you just wanted to actually test your data properly, in the case where you are reading untrusted data, then any kind of a check at all on the data will consider it to be um, validated. So here I've checked to make sure that the uh, length of the resource is, is, is possible within the length of that file. It's unsigned, so there's no need to check for less than zero. If it was signed, you have to check both ends of it, otherwise it'll be considered unchecked. You get a lot of that, especially in the image filters. Uh, yeah, sliding stuff. Um, the other thing that's difficult to deal with in uh, Coverity is its handling, is its tracking of exceptions. It's very good at tracking where an exception could be thrown from, which gives us a lot of uh, uh, exception warnings in areas where, in practice, it's not going to happen. Typically. Uh, you get something like from the configuration, where the configuration could throw, but that configuration is going to throw the first time it's read. And typically, like you read maybe at start of the constructor, and then you read the same uh, configuration data in the destructor. When it comes into the destructor, and if there's, a, for instance, a standard unique pointer which cannot uh, have any exceptions to it, it's going to, uh, you're going to be told that it's going to abort it ever happened but it's not going to happen. I mean, it could happen if somebody deleted the configuration while your program is running, but in practice, it's not going to happen. So how are you going to get rid of these? You can either come up with a really convoluted scheme of catching the exceptions, but it's all just going to make your code a, a complete mess, or you just accept that it's not going to happen. You want to hear about other cases like that, but just not in this specific case. 
so when you get that warning, the most recent one was just yesterday, the day before, and you have your standard knee point, and you can pass in the a deleted parameter, and the deleted parameters are that O3 TL uh, default delete, which, when it's not running in, when it's not compiled in Converity, it just does the, the standard delete, and you assume that that exception isn't going to happen. And just to tell Converity not to worry about it, you have effectively that. It's not exactly the same code. I shrunk it to fit on the slide. And then you can see that if underscore underscore Converity underscore underscore is defined, you know that you're running under Converity, and then that silences uh, that whole set of warnings so that you don't have to uh, worry about them. All right, so it was kind of uh, the trips and tips and techniques we've been using to get conversion numbers low, to get it manageable, and what we always want to really hear about is um, changes in warnings from conversion. So this is yesterday's uh, stats on conversion in 20. So we just fixed um, the last warning there again, so we're back down to zero warnings. And uh, the number of code we have, you can see that we're analyzing 6.1 million lines of code. We're down from about 6.5 million lines of code since 2018, so we've actually shrunk our code quite a bit, which is nice, hasn't happened for a while. And those are the figures we have there. The other uh, stat I have as well is a timeline of how many bugs we started off with back in 2014 and shrunk it all the way down, and the various gaps. And then you see there's a gap there where we didn't have the ability to run Converity for a couple of months because we required C++17 and there wasn't C++17 support in Converity until whatever it was, July uh, last year. So the numbers rise when it's not been constantly kept under control. Yeah, so that's the uh, end of the Converity <coughs> section. So the OSS Fuzz, that's where there's a huge big giant set of uh, cores set aside on Google's uh, cloud where it fuzzes documents for us, uh, in this case, uh, they build on their side uh, our project on their compilers and their hardware. They call our script, uh, that script which we find in our source tree, which uh, builds uh, the, the various fuzzers in our configuration. So we have 45 different fuzzer targets. We've got all of the graphics file formats, BMP, GAF, PNG, JPEG, etc., etc. Then the file formats such as like Doc, Excel, and all those ones, our own file formats in the flat version, so the flat ODT, flat ODF, and all them. So there's 45 individual targets, and then they build them on their side in three different configurations: uh, two lib fuzzer ones, the address sanitizer, uh, the undefined behavior sanitizer, and then there's one with the American fuzzy lop uh, fuzzer, which basically is the address sanitizer version of that as well. So the three of them. All build, all run continuously, giving us 135 running away uh, constantly. Uh, what's a real problem for us is that the configuration on their side is with no dynamic libraries at all. Uh, you can find the configuration in that directory there if you're, in, if you're interested. The what we do there is we reuse that disabled dynamic loading thing, which is intended for iOS. It's a little bit fragile because uh, Tor. He manages it effectively, and he manages it for iOS. So when there's iOS changes there, there can be unexpected changes for the fuzzing as well. So new, pro new components added to iOS will end up getting compiled on the um, different configuration for OSS fuzz, and it doesn't always succeed. Uh, the individual fuzzers are still unfortunately very large, about 300 megs per fuzzer, when they really should be you know, a tenth of that. Uh, so they're individually quite large. We don't run with a configuration layer inside in the fuzzing land, so we just hard code various defaults, and then you can use that at runtime to determine whether or not you are being fuzzing or not, whether the configuration is being avoided and put in some other kind of default. If anybody else is interested in running fuzzers against us, uh, that's the URL you can find. There are seed corpuses for the 60 file formats. Uh, the 45 file formats are mentioned there, and an additional 15 from the uh, document liberation uh, project with the extra filters that are fuzzed uh, separately. So you have uh, corpses there which are uh, not our full collection of file of formats for that file format, but a cut down set of the minimized set that exercise the most code paths without exceeding, I don't know, is it about half a, a megan size or something per individual case. Uh, that's what the OSS Fuzz website looks like. Uh, their documents, their bugs are again private and they remain private for 60 or 90 days until after their report, after they're fixed something like that. Uh, so a lot of these issues are now uh, publicly available. You can examine them if you wish, but by default they're private for the first time. What's nice, I find, is that the minimizer there, you can start off with a, um, a large test case, 
in this case it's not too big, 334 bytes, but then it'll minimize it itself down to the smallest case so you don't have to work with a large document when you do get something reported. So let's see, a kind of a more recent actual bug that came in. Shoop. Uh, the original top line is the original code, and then there's a kind of an easy hack on the way at the moment to find better integer types. So it went from the cell underscore u long, which is um, effectively a size t, and it was changed into a size u16 because in colors is a size u16. But that means then during the shift operation with the wonderful C++ promotion rules, it becomes an int. At that point, then you have two signed ins, and then you try to add them together, and the numbers are too large to fit in signed ins, and you get this undefined um, behavior warning like that. And then at the bottom is a, a simple fix to send it back to an unsigned type and you get rid of the issue again. So that's the kind of, um, uh, kind of bug you get out from uh, UBSAM. What complicates things in OSS fuzz is mostly the timeouts. And the timeout of about 25 seconds, at which case, at which point they log a bug saying your target is slow. Uh, they'll only report one at a time, so you get one timeout bug per, per target. If you fix the timeout bug for target, you typically get another timeout bug a couple of days later for a different issue. So it's a real treadmill. Um, some of the file formats, we seem to have gotten rid of all of the timeouts because there hasn't been any reported for ages, so no one seems to have solved the ODF timeouts, for example. Uh, what's outstanding at the moment is various timeouts in the doc filter, uh, LWP filter, the Lotus WordPro filter, and a few other ones like that. Some of them come and go. We're just barely on the threshold, and we slip below it for a couple of weeks. It disappears, and we rise above it again, and it reappears. So how can we help with the timeout? <coughs> Obviously, if we're processing infinite data, you're, it's going to time out in, uh, at some stage. So they're all uh, there's a dot options file inside that VCL work bin directory that says the maximum input you can deal with. Normally, it's, it's the 64K. Some file formats take longer than that, so we slip it 32K or some number that gets it all in. So you can adjust that. Some of the file formats, though, no matter how small you uh, limit the input, they have a basically, effectively, a near infinite decompression ability. So you give them 10 bytes, and they can generate you know, hundreds and hundreds of megs from that by just saying, you know, uh, the putting in an integer and saying that there's going to be this many zeros following it. So you have to have some way to limit that. So when we're running under um, the OSS fuzz, and if that fuzz max input len, which comes from the max len above, is set, then you can say that uh, decompression is limited to some arbitrary multiple of that value. So depending on some filters, some filters are 256 times that value, sometimes they're 1,000 times. But there is some ceiling limit to the amount of decompression that's allowed given the, the input. And obviously, of course, uh, sometimes the timeouts are just reporting that there's an infinite loop. So here's an example of a true infinite loop inside one of the file formats where it's a chain of properties read. Each property tells where the opposite of the next chain is. So a uh, simple technique that's commonly used in a lot of the filters is just to track what places have been visited already, what offsites have already been visited. So if you've already visited one particular uh, link in the chain, and then you return to the same link again, then obviously there's something wrong. Your loop is corrupt, your document is bust, and you just break and move on. So that's the most common um, uh, uh, solution for the real case of the infinite loops. <coughs> the run then is out of memories. There's another issue as well as that. You're limited to two gigs, and where you trigger that. Uh, is JPEG itself, uh, there's a couple of examples of simple files that will break right through that limit that are perfectly legitimate uh, JPEG files. Um, JPEG Turbo, we got some patches into that to convince them that we could um, set and honor the old flag for JPEG memory, which we already existed, but to honor it so that it would, you could set some ceiling for how far JPEG will allocate. Similarly, inside in Calc, you can set max matrix elements for some of the uh, Calc file formats to help limit that. And similarly, no threaded calculation brings things under some kind of control as well. Uh, various uh, tips and tricks there. Uh, in code for the practical, the most useful thing, of course, is just double checking how much data is available uh, and setting and comparing that to what the headers of, especially the image filters claim. The image filters claim there's a huge graphic coming up. You can check to see if that's possible. Some of the file formats, of course, are decompressed, so you have to look at whether or not the decompression would uh, be able to fill in that data. So some of the filters have known max compression levels you know that if uh, a GIF cannot produce more than that ratio uh, against its input data. So we do that for a number of the uh, 
uh, uh, binary file formats, we compare what their max possible com decompression of the input is, and if it exceeds that, we, we fail that again. So they have practical, real-world implications. Yeah, so that's the results for um, the amount of OSS reports we've been getting. So in the last three years, we've gotten basically a 1,000 of them, which is roughly about one a day, but they've all been front-loaded for the first two years. There's a huge tail-off last year. Uh, we've been adding them incrementally over those two years, so every time a particular fuzzer was added and began to not give constant results, we could add in the next fuzzer, so it was kind of kept to that limit. We've stopped adding fuzzers now. I think we've got most things covered, and we're still getting this constant trickle, but it's nowhere near the flood it was before. And that said, of course, any time anybody makes any changes to a given filter, they tend to reproduce some problems as well. So there were some changes yesterday to the Lotus Word Pro filter, and I can see that I have five or six new issues reported against it already. So, uh, yeah, it's very dangerous and fraught to change any of those uh, kind of hacky binary file filters. Right, and that's what I've got. That's the end. Is there any questions? Oh. Uh, does it mean that they, they Google does the passing with uh, other platforms like this? Not for us, but I think they have their own. Uh, they reuse all these for Chromium. Okay. So I think uh, for Chromium, they have uh, different platforms that they test Chromium on separately on. But for our case, it's, it's, just, it's just Linux that they, they work on. So yeah, all of the stuff you see here is they, they reuse it for, for their own software, and they just let us have a, a little bite at it. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.